Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon or good evening. Pete Pardo here from Sea Tranquility. Welcome to another edition of Friday Morning at the Fun House with my good friend Martin Popoff, Canada and New York. I'm looking at gray skies, 12 degrees out this morning, Martin. Yeah, we're looking at uh, bright, bright blue skies and uh, in Fahrenheit, two degrees. So it's uh, it's minus 16 or so right now up here in Celsius. Yeah, it's crazy freezing. We had almost the most snow we've ever had here. We uh, it, they say in some places 55 centimeters, which is about I think it's about two feet. Um, but yeah, I'll kind of all over where I am downtown. It was about a, about a foot and a half of snow, which is which is quite a lot for for one day it's in in kind of the top five that they had here yeah that's, a, and that's now a, now it's turning to concrete they say like there's cars well, there's still yeah. on that day there were cars you would walk down the street and there were there were cars where all you could see was their rear view mirror sticking out it was it was that covered that's crazy <laughs> yeah i mean we we had uh, a little bit of snow we got like uh three or four inches early in the week and then the temperatures rose up a little bit. So it froze. So yeah. it's like, like you said, it's like concrete. And yeah. then the temperatures went up again and some of it melted. Then we got like another two inches uh, yesterday. Yeah. So you walk outside, it's all crunchy and icy. And it's, it's just, yeah. I, I'm not into the ice thing. And yeah. Uh, yeah. so, you know, know, trying to get your, uh, my, my snowblower did not like it the other day because the snow that we had was really wet and heavy. So the snowblower was like, nah, we're not doing this. So I had to go out and shovel and, you know, yeah. At 56 years old trying to shovel this really heavy snow not very good on the back and then the back patio was all ice and my dogs are not liking that so it's just like oh man the hudson valley is a mess right now but we don't have two plus feet of snow thankfully but <laughs> yeah yeah anyway so uh we've got here for everybody today another uh viewer suggestion just so you know we are looking through your suggestions that you've been posting here on the channel in the little uh community discussion that's going on there so uh, we do go through those uh, occasionally and look for some cool ideas this is a good one. This was a very challenging one for me, especially. So the suggestion to do a show was all about those bands where maybe we only really like one of their albums and the rest we don't kind of really don't care about or never bothered with or whatever the reason. And, and there's no, this, these bands can have as many albums, you know, or lots of albums, very little albums, whatever, but there's really only one that ever really did anything to us. So Martin and I have spent the last week trying to figure out five choices each of bands that fit this criteria. And uh, I think we're ready to go. So we'll have Martin kick us off with his uh, first selection. All right, so as usual with uh, suggestions like this, great suggestion. Um, I had to go with definitely the first one I thought of that always fits this for me uh, because I have to defend this all the time to people. Uh, the Beatles with the White Album. Um, so here's, here's a weird situation where, you know, first girlfriend, grade two, seven years old, um, you know, I, I'm just getting into music and, uh, you know, her, pa her parents had the white album and they were, they were like, uh, yeah, this, you know, they were from Austria and, and he was a dentist and, and, you know, she was like, a, like a good looking mom and they had this big house, uh, you know, it was all cedar shakes and angles and cool stuff. Like it was a really European situation. Right. And, uh, and I can still picture now just sitting in that living room in the sun with all the windows around, uh, you know, pulling all the pieces of the white album and listening to it. Um, so, so that really got me uh, in, into the white album. And then quickly after, you know, I discovered Nazareth and deep purple and black Sabbath. And then, and then we were militant, militant metalheads for the rest of forever. Uh, you know, with our rating system where mathematically an album only mattered if it was heavy and all this sort of stuff. So it was a weird outlier in that way. And there were a couple albums early on, but, um, and then, you know, the other thing that happened is this, this was all right in the whole thing with the, uh, the Charles Manson Helter Skelter murders and all that stuff. And this album was associated with that. They listened to it, they quoted from it and all that kind of thing. I can't remember when the book came out, the Vincent Bugliosi or whatever his name is book. Um, but I, I do remember reading that when it did come out. And, um, and so, yeah, so this was all right around that time. Um, and so I've just always felt that. So, so by moving on to the metal thing, it's like, it's like the Beatles, we we've had this discussion before somewhat on air and somewhat off air about how, you know, the older and older and older music gets, it's just, just objectively and mathematically going to sound less impressive. Right. And the Beatles, 
definitely fall into that because this is not a band where you're remembering the awesome guitar solos and the great drumming. And, you know, the production is, is like there's ear candy, but it's not really high tech production. It's not Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon or whatever. Right. Um, so so when you when you're a kid and you start getting into heavy stuff, um, you know, that Beatles stuff isn't really going to sound that impressive. But this album just, you know, I, I remember every song on it and I remember you know, the heaviness that I, that I, you know, my ears perked up with, why don't we do it in the road and birthday and back in the USSR and uh, Helter Skelter, especially and the spookiness of number nine and all that stuff, right? Revolution number nine. Um, and I, I just, and, and of course, never knew about the sort of disjointedness of it. And I'm also a sucker for double albums, right? Um, you know, double albums are such a huge statement. And, uh, and so for whatever reason, yeah, I've read a couple Beatles books and I know my Beatles as much as uh, you know a music nerd is if you're not totally into them right because there's like over a thousand Beatles books apparently but there's no other album I really care about or know about a whole heck of a heck of a lot because obviously this is a band where the hits are played all over the place anyways so you're always going to get the Beatles anyways but um, this just feels like an incredible journey and uh, the other amazing thing is uh, you know, when when you get an amazing, amazing reissue like this box set, uh, that just reinforces your your love of something like that because you go in and you learn about it even more and more. So, uh, all my choices really are 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 these where um, what one's a little less, but you said we like one album by a band. This is this is like I love one album by a band, and I've played it a thousand times, and everything else is under a hundred kind of thing. In, in most cases, right? Yeah. Um, so there you go. That's my first choice. Uh, just my strange relationship with the Beatles. One absolute masterpiece talisman that I've played over and over and over. I know front to back and the rest of the albums barely know them really. Wow, that's an interesting choice. I would have, uh, so like Rubber Soul and... No, I have to look at the track listing and read the Wikipedia page and go, oh, that's interesting. I don't remember that song and I'll go play it and stuff. And, they, and they're just like in, in my mind, out of my mind, don't think about it for another you know, year or whatever kind of thing. But White Album's just kind of a regular. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, because um, I, I would have thought initially, you know, most people who are like casual Beatles fans, you know, like Abbey Road, always right up there. Sergeant Pepper, always right up there. Um, yeah, well, that's that's a cool pick. That's a bold pick, Martin. That, that's a contrarian pick, I think. Yeah, it's a good it's, album, it's, though. I'm not knocking the album because I mean, I, I love yeah. I love the White Album too. It's just it's interesting that that is so far and ahead of all the other Beatles albums, uh, the ones you really really care about. So pretty cool. Yeah, and it's always embarrassing admitting you're not you're not a complete Beatles uh, expert. Well, I mean, uh, that's on any the, level, right? Yeah, I mean, that's that's the tough thing. I think you know, so many people think that you automatically have to love the Beatles with every ounce of passion in you and they automatically have to be the best band of all time. And it's like, I love the Beatles, but they're not like a top 20 band for me. I mean, I, I love them, but I like other bands more. And it's like, and it doesn't take away from my love of their music and them as musicians. I, I you know, this stuff is brilliant, but you know, I grew up liking different stuff. And I, I, as I've gotten older, I've gotten to appreciate the Beatles more and more, but it's still, you know, they, to me, they don't compare with some of the, the heavy bands that I just are just a bigger part of me. It's just, you know, it doesn't take away from the greatness of the Beatles, but and like I always say, not everybody has to love the same music and the same bands the same way, right? But you can still appreciate all of them. So cool. All right, my first choice here is uh, a band that uh, debuted in 1990, and the lead guitar player came from another very popular band called Dokken, and my album uh, from Lynch Mob is called Wicked Sensation, and Martin was kind enough to help me out here with the CD because I cannot track down my CD copy anywhere. Um, yeah, I mean, I have followed this band from the beginning, and I have found that while I have really, really tried to to really love them as much as I really like Dokken. Uh, I found other than this debut album, Wicked Sensation, I found most of the albums pretty lackluster. And the only one I really ever go back to is this one. Uh, it's got arguably the best singer from this band, Oni Logan. Uh, you know, George kind of seemed to me to have this whole Ingve Malmsteen complex or Richie Blackmore, where he's just constantly changing singers, constantly changing drummers and bass players. I mean, it's like this whole revolving door. 
which doesn't do a band like this any justice for me. And they've had like a spotty recording career, you know, sometimes big lapses in, in releases and all that sort of thing. But I think Oni was always the best singer in this band. I don't, and I think most fans would agree on that. I don't know why uh, George didn't kind of see that, but he just never seemed to be happy with singers and then some would come and go. And, you know, just really on this album though, the hooks are here. It's a lot of songs. It's a pretty long now, but I think it's got has his best guitar work. There's good riffs. Uh, it's very different than Dokken. It's more bluesy, but I think that's what he was going with. Uh, and I always found that every other album was kind of like a rehash of this one. I remember when that second album came out, I think it was self-titled. <clears throat> it just, to me, it sounded like it was trying to be that debut album, but not as successful. You know, Smoke This, <clears throat> excuse me, Revolution, uh, even uh, Rebel, one of the more recent ones. You know, they're mildly entertaining, but I don't find that they're as consistent through it through as that first one. And you could probably arguably say that all, out of all the Lynch Mob albums, are any of them a true classic? I don't know, but I always seem to go back to the first one, Wicked Sensation, uh, as the best, the most memorable, and really the only one that I'm ever interested in playing, which, I mean, I really like George Lynch as a player. Uh, I have found his whole career after Dokken is kind of, I kind of feel the same thing about it. It's like, he's got all these bands and projects and like, to me, very few of them are truly, truly memorable and make me want to go back to uh, other than the original, you know, bunch of Dokken albums and uh, this first one from Lynch Mob. So there you go. Yeah. And, and obviously, I mean, this is, you know, had this been five years earlier or whatever, I mean, this could have been a, a huge band, uh, you know, great name of a band. You got the yeah. guy in, you know, guy's name in the name and it's a great name. And, and, you know, it, it had, had you got five, five albums in a row from this lineup, that would have been great. But like you say, it just, it just devolved because basically hair metal was over at this point, you know, yeah. bunch, bunch of guys on a motorcycle like that. That's, that's, I know, not, right? <laughs> that's not the new image, right? <laughs> In, in Seattle, you're supposed to just ride the bus, right? Because you're all broke because That's you, it. you got you know, no money right here. All your money on heroin, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, so you okay. reach into that flannel pocket, shirt pocket, right? I got, here's, here's a quarter. That's all I got. You know, yeah. So, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Negotiate with the bus driver, right? Yeah, exactly. I'll, I'll, trip, give you, yeah. I'll give you my lunch, right? I'll give you my lunch for a uh, pass on the bus. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Funny. Um, all right. My next choice. Um, this, this one fits a category. Um, it's Talking Heads. I don't even have the album. Here's their live album, Talking Heads. I feel like I've talked about them before, so I'm gonna I'm gonna keep this kind of kind of brief. But but I really feel that I needed one in this category for this lineup. And the category is almost like um, getting on the bandwagon, getting on the bandwagon when everybody else is, and getting getting swept up in the excitement of a certain era of a band. And to me, Talking Heads kind of fits that with Little Creatures. Little Creatures is the one that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm always amazed how many records uh, these guys sold. Uh, they had, the first one didn't certify. The second one went gold. Fear of Music went gold. Remain in Light went gold. Speaking in Tongues went platinum. Just not a very listenable or accessible album at all. And that's the thing that always bothered me about Talking Heads. They're the ultimate critics band where, where you know, you're supposed to love them, you know, if you're smart. Um, and I just don't like them at all. But Little Creatures comes out and and they're kind of like the it band. They're the exciting band for, for a minute. So, so every time we get annoyed at casual music fans in general for only only wanting one album of a band i feel you know the next layer down into the music nerds you can you can also have that same thing happen where you're like on board semi because everybody else is on board at the same time but also little creatures which went double platinum like it was a big album for them 1985 um but the but the neat thing about it is it it's just poppy and accessible song to song. It's where they kind of put it all together. It wasn't as spare and, and like economical and poor sounding as the first two albums, but it wasn't also like really experimental and weird and, you know, world music and, and hip hop beats and all this kind of stuff um, as, as some of their material. So, so every song I remember when I, when I just see the song titles, I can, I can play them in my head. And it was like, yeah, okay. I'm on board with talking heads. I'm supposed to be, I'm supposed to be a big We're music fan. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, uh, and, you know, then they had the true stories thing, which is kind of a soundtracky thing. And then naked they're they're all their last album, which their last album was in 1988. I mean, they basically ended. It's kind of an odd situation like that. Most most of these bands come back, right? Yeah. Um, but even that one wasn't uh, accessible at all. So so yeah, I, I definitely wanted one in here. And when we get to honorable mentions, I got a couple others that feel like it's part of that, 
you know, I'm, I'm the casual fan in there and just being swept up in the excitement of this is their moment when they're kind of the it band. And, and it felt like that for Talking Heads in, in 1985, finally. Yeah. yeah. yeah I, uh, I, I never bought into them. And, but yeah, you're absolutely right. It's like you were, they were like this kind of cool, different band that everybody should like, right? And it's like, you know, <clears throat> songs all over the radio, all over MTV, all this kind of stuff. And I always were like, nah, <clears throat> not my thing, not my thing. And then like, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, I said, you know what? I'm older now. I appreciate some different stuff now. And maybe that I didn't when I was younger. So I went out and bought like a, uh, a Talking Heads Greatest Hits. And I, you know, I remember like, I listened to it a few times. I was like, yeah, I remember all these songs. I'm still not crazy about it. <laughs> <laughs> that's like but i i but i can listen to it and be like okay you know it's kind of it's time and i don't mind it i don't dislike it but uh, and, and it's kind of cool hearing some of the uh the deeper cuts that were on the collection that i got which i was not familiar with but uh yeah it's still i i look back on that band and i'm like yeah it's still really not my thing but i can totally see why tons and tons of people really enjoyed them because it is pretty pleasing on the ears it's an easy listen and they were kind of different at the time so i get it. i get it all right. Uh, like Martin was just saying, this is a band I think we've talked about quite a bit on various shows, but th this was the first band that came to mind. And I'm kind of cheating here because they only ever had two studio albums, but one is really great and the really the only one deserving of our time and specifically my time. And the other one is just really unmemorable. And the band is uh, Blue Murder, 1989. This is their debut Terrific album, super group, John Sykes, fresh off a of white snake, was in Thin Lizzy Tigers of Pantang. You got Carmine of Peace, legendary drummer. You got Tony Franklin, legendary bass player, was in the firm, lots of other things. And, uh, you know, this comes out after the big white snake album. John is obviously out of the band by the time that hits the streets. And this basically takes that kind of formula. Um, you know, you hear this and you're thinking, okay, I, you can tell that John had a lot to do with the songwriting and creation of the 87 uh, White Snake album. It's just big, ballsy, kind of at the tail end of the whole hair metal thing. Uh, the music is a bit heavier, more serious, but it kind of fits in there, but not. It's more of just a really classic hard rock and, and metal album. And the band just, I think they really thought they were going to do big business with this. And it kind of didn't. I mean, most people listened to it, heard it, owned it. They played some live stuff. They had some MTV videos, but it was not the big blockbuster I thought that John was hoping for. And even the other guys, because I mean, Carmine had carried a bit of weight at the time. But then they took like four years to come out with the follow up. And by the time the follow up came out, you know, Franklin and a piece were basically not even in the band anymore, although they appear on the album. He's got a fresh new lineup of people that nobody cares about. And the Nothing But Trouble album is just really mediocre at best. I never listened to it. Uh, I, I, I couldn't even tell you the last time I listened to that that album, probably probably been 20 years. And uh, but this I still listen to fairly often if they never did that second album. And quite frankly, if they never have a reunion again, I don't think it really matters because really the only one that's really of any interest to me is the debut. So there you go. Yeah, fun, funny, semi funny story about that debut. I mean, I was playing it in the car the other day and uh, and I, I got this sort of thought in my mind that um, I've always had kind of a barrier up even against the debut in that it feels like everything is not high in the mix. And it's like, how can that possibly be? Right. And I was I was preparing for um, I'm going to we're going to do a contrarians episode with with Sean Kelly. A uh, buddy of mine on uh, on Cinderella. And I was listening to Heartbreak Station uh, again, and I felt the same thing. It's like, how can nothing be high in the mix? You know, and 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 it's like I'm not saying everything's equal in the mix. It's like I'm saying I can't hear anything. I can't hear the guitars. The drums are brash and noisy, but I'm not really hearing what they're doing. The vocals certainly don't feel high in the mix. So it's it's a funny thing with that record. And I've always been that way. You know, you you can tell the material is really cool. Oh yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's like, what what is going on with my ears here with this? And Cinderella has always felt that way with me. It's like, it's like I just, I can't get into this band because I just can't hear anything. I, I don't know what's going on on this on this record. So, yeah. Yeah, I think the, the Blue Murder album uh, sounds like it was recorded like in a cave. Um, it's, to my ears, it's not terrible, but yeah, it's definitely there's something missing there, right? It should be, and parts of it are like, you have these big swells and it's bombastic at times, but it should be, like it doesn't burst out of the speakers like the White Snake album does. 
right? You listen to that and it's just like, holy shit, this is immense. Whereas yeah. this should be immense. And in spots, it's really not. So yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know if that had anything to do with the public perception of it or not. I don't know. I, I just think it, again, another one of those albums that came out like two years before might have done a lot better. I mean, I would look at this like I look at the Badlands stuff. It's just like great material, should have been huge, didn't, didn't really yeah. catch on, unfortunately. Yeah. All right. Speaking of production, uh, my next choice, I'm, I'm doing my, my next episode of my audio podcast history in five songs with martin popoff is going to be called early mutt lang and um this is uh this is my next choice and i actually the episode was inspired by getting getting ready for this um so so this kind of came first and i thought i'm gonna do something on early mutt lang so my next one is city boy the day the earth caught fire uh -huh. and this is a perfect example again a little bit like the beatles except nothing compares to the beatles but uh but the idea here is that um again i mean city boy had five or six albums or so we've got uh we've got some book early going on that's kind of a later one there's the first one city boy there's the second one dinner at the ritz i think we got another one in here at least well, that's the same one, I guess, again. And uh, we've got we got the later one. It was supposed to be good. Look at it. It's called Heads Are, Heads are Rolling. Uh, it's after uh, Day the Earth Caught Fire, but not as good as Day the Earth Caught Fire. So my, my whole point with City Boy, first of all, on the production end, so when Mutt Lang moves from, from South Africa to, to the UK, uh, City Boy is the first kind of big thing he does, and he produces all five of those first City Boy albums. So we're up to 1979, so this is like the fourth or the fifth or whatever, and uh, absolutely fits this concept because I think this is a masterpiece start to finish. I love every song on it. I love the pomp rock on it. I love the prog. I love the amazing ambition suite at the end at 12 minutes long i love the heavy song machines um i might have said this before but I'll, I'll always remember every time i play machines it's like i remember bonding with king diamond over that song and him singing machines to me over the phone you know because <laughs> he he loves this album as well um but everything just comes together it's the heaviest of them all um but the point is is again played this over a thousand times played every other city boy album probably under under 40 times each right mm -hmm. uh, big big huge difference so so it's it's the idea uh, you know the theme of this episode i mean the idea is you're just pouring all your love into that one album and 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 putting all your eggs in that basket and loving everything about the quirkiness and weirdness of this band but all in one place and you start championing the band in your minds as they're not geniuses all the time but you're championing championing them as geniuses for this one time and you think they're absolute geniuses right now and and i'm on board and loving every single thing they do on it. every decision they make you think they're making it because they're geniuses right um so so city boy really feels like that on this 1979 album weird year for rock uh the, the day the earth caught fire and just one other point um i was watching i haven't finished it but i was watching the sparks movie recently right and uh, City Boy really reminds me of Sparks, uh, that that whole the falsetto and the sort of, uh, you know, I, I remember talking to Mark Sla uh, 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 Mike Slamer once. Right. And and saying, you know, when we were growing up as kids, we always thought uh, you guys were a gay band. Everybody was gay in this band. Right. And he laughed and said, you know, he goes, no, we were certainly not gay and all that. Right. And and this kind of comes up in the Sparks movie as well, because it's it's so dance hall and the high falsetto vocals and stuff and sparks have a huge gay following right but they don't really address it in the movie but but it just it's it's like when you go back and play those sparks albums you go wow this this almost seems like tailor made for the gay community or whatever right and and that's that's one of the problems with that sparks movie they don't really go into like what kind of music is this because it's really odd strange uh music with uh with I, again that whole uk dance hall thing like all that stuff about the weird songs we don't like from from queen on on night of the opera and day at the races sort of thing right and and i feel a little bit of that in city boy and you know in and even the pictures they look like sort of that that classic era of uh of kind of gay fashion in the in the 70s right so yeah. it's it's just a funny thing about that band is that is they have this odd odd sound where 
where um you know it's it it's very it's it's got a little bit bit of that queen like sound but sparks even more so that uh, that you notice in their sound and uh but uh, I don't know if I don't, I don't think City Boy had a gay following. I don't think they had any following, really. They just uh, yeah. were never a very good <laughs> that, that was the band at all, right? <laughs> yeah. But um, but it also feels very much like, as they say, they say Mutt Lang was like the the seventh member of the band. Yeah. And it really feels like a um, it really feels like um, like quite a studio project that band. And you start to hear, as I say in this episode, you start to hear the the uh the vaulted stacked vocals and 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 sort of that dry clunky drum sound that he brings into the likes of high and dry um and maybe a little bit pyromania or whatever but yeah, yeah. love that record to death i thought it was the perfect example yeah i like the band a lot and uh, i like that album a lot and i like all of them actually but yeah very artful band i mean they're just they're very unique sounding and uh maybe a little too unique sounding for the masses who knows who knows yeah all right, so my next choice uh, also came to mind uh, when we were talking about doing this, and this is a this is a band where they always seem to come up in prog conversations, and they're another one of those kind of uh, historical prog bands from the Great White North, and but every time like they come up in a conversation, really only this one album comes up. And it's the only album that really ever interested me, although I like a couple of their other records, but to an extent, uh, but really to me, the only real classic they have that I go back to over and over and over again is uh, FM Black Noise from 1977. Mm. Kind of a unique band, right? They're uh, they're a prog band, but they're they're pretty, their music's pretty accessible. They got a guy who plays like a violin and mandolin, or electric violin and mandolin, which is pretty neat. Uh, Nash the Slash, otherwise, what's his name? Ben Mink, something like that. Um, really cool band. This it's kind of spacey, it's kind of poppy. A lot of great songs on here, you know, Phasers on Stun, Journey, uh, Dialing for Dom. I mean, the whole the, people always talk about this in such high regard. Um, and it's start to finish a lot of fun, really good, memorable songs, a lot of great playing. But you know, they released some other albums like uh, Direct Disc, which is also known as Headroom. Uh, that's got its moments and then they release surveillance and here we're looking you know the early the late 70s going into the 80s and all of a sudden you know the instrumentation is pretty good but the the vocals and the choruses are really poppy and the band by this you know starts to lose that kind of aura that they had right here from the debut and uh, I just I never found them as interesting after this album, even though there are parts of other albums and songs and things that I do like, but it's almost like, you know, when the topic of FM comes up, it's almost like they only ever released this album, even though they've got like, what, like seven, eight albums, something like that. They had a nice little career. Uh, but this, in my mind, always seems to be the only one that really means anything. And uh, so I thought it was like a perfect choice for this particular uh, episode here. But yeah, this I remember when I first started listening to, to Prague, like seriously, uh, in the early 90s, I mean, anybody I talked to is like, well, you got to have that first FM album. That, that's that's a classic. It's one of the great Canadian Prague albums of all time. And but nobody ever mentions any of the other ones. There, like I said, there are moments on the other ones, but this is really the only one that to me matters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I have almost like a complete blank spot with those guys. I never think about them. I barely know them. It's really odd, right? So it's uh, I, I suppose people are going to be shocked about certain certain bands we don't know anything about, right? I mean, I see it in the comments, right? Yeah. So uh, yeah, pretty pretty weird. All right. Uh, okay. So my next one is uh, even more so than the City Boy or the or the Beatles situation. Um, this absolute masterpiece right here, The Chameleons UK with Strange Times, came out in 1986, Manchester band. Um, but the funny thing about this band, so again, I mean, this is an album I've probably played 2,000 times. Uh, I, I literally probably play parts of this album a couple times a week. And actually, I found this really quite odd. There's a quote from Noel Gallagher from Oasis where he says... Uh, um, I've forgotten how much this album meant to me. It came out in 86. I was 19. I've been listening to it every day since. And I have to say it's blown my mind again. It must have influenced my early years as a songwriter because I can hear me in it everywhere. I mean, they don't sound anything like Oasis. This is just a absolute masterpiece of dark, atmospheric guitar, bass and drums, keyboards, um, 
a little bit of it's it's produced by David M. Allen, who's the Cures producer. But the but the odd thing about this band is that um, they only made four albums. There were two before this, and then one kind of reunion album. But the but the legend is so big that you 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 scroll down on Spotify, and there's like five or six live albums before you get to any of the studio albums. There's the acoustic album, you know, compilations. Um, so the legend is huge on these guys, um, but they broke up shortly after this album, the manager died. And then they went on, two of the guys went on and did this amazing record here, the sun and the moon, which isn't as good as strange times, but they only made one album. What a great album cover. eh? so, yeah, so yeah. weird. Eh? With just one tarot card in the middle of it, no writing on it just says, yeah, just just X V I I I Les Soleil, um, but uh, but this is this is a spooky, depressing, creepy. Could have been on another episode. Uh, uh, I don't think I included it on that, but it no, could have been. I, I think I, I think I considered it, and we were talking about this. That's right. We I I, I definitely was going to, and then we had this idea, and I thought, no, I'm going to save it for that. Um, so yeah, Strange Times is just uh, and when it came out in North America, I can't find my vinyl, which is really bothering me. Um, but when it came out in North America, it came with a separate EP as well. It's got a sticker on the front there, but um, just really cool artwork and just just dark, murky, a little bit Cure, Echo and the Bunny Man. Uh, so it's it's kind of post punk, but it's a little proggy as well. Big, huge drums, and just just really kind of frightening, dark lyrics. Um, Mark Burgess, the leader of the band, said, Strange Times is my favorite. Personally, I believe it was the best lyrical work I'd done uh, uh, with the band and some of the best vocal performances. And I think Chameleons really began to mature and move forward with this album. Um, you know, the other reason I mention it is a lot of people do prefer uh, one or two of the early ones as, as a better Chameleons album. But um, yeah, literally... I, I, I swear I must have played this 2000 times at least. And, and it's just always regularly gets played. One of my most played albums of all time. And I barely, barely know the other albums at all, which is really odd. Yep. I mean, it happens, right? I mean, yep. I, I, my next choice is a perfect example of, of that. Um, Self-titled debut from the River Dogs in 1990. Okay. Yeah. What a great album. I listened to this a ton when it came out. I still like enjoy listening to this. Uh, one of those bands that in my mind should have been huge. I mean, they had all the tools, great songs. Rob Lamoth, great singer, great guitar playing from Vivian Campbell. I, I feel like since Vivian left Dio that he's, he, we've still been like kind of waiting for that band you know him in that in a certain band where we get to hear the vivian campbell all the time and you know and def leppard he's not that guy uh you know last in line i think is is kind of closer to hearing the true vivian campbell but again they're doing like an homage to the dio stuff but i always thought that him in this band was just terrific and i just don't understand why this album wasn't huge it's just got all the tools but it just didn't didn't do nothing, right? Didn't do anything. I think those of us who are into it realize how great it is and we wish the rest of the world kind of picked up on it. Never happened. Uh, they had a couple other albums, you know, Vivian was a part of it, he wasn't. And quite frankly, it's not as good as this. They did that reunion album, uh, California in 2017, which I think is pretty good, but I haven't felt the need to revisit it. Like, six months after it came out, I was kind of like, all right, this is all right. Went on the shelf. I probably listened to this 10, 15 times since that album came out and never, never revisited that. And, and like I said, the other albums have some good material, but there's something about the excitement that I think came out of listening to this album. And uh, I still get excited listening to this album that I just don't get with any of the other ones. And uh, yeah, to me, it's the only album they ever did. Right. And I think you talk to some people who are, who are probably casual fans and they'd be surprised to hear that they had other albums other than this. So yeah. it's a cool. shame. Yeah, they never I, I barely know that album. I definitely have heard it and I think I reviewed it, but I, but I barely even remember it. So yeah, there's so many of those, the law and uh, what are some of the, a shadow King, right? Shadow these, King. these kind of semi super group albums <laughs> and a bluesy rootsy end of things. And it's the death of that kind of music and blah, blah, blah. Right. So shadow King's pretty good, actually. That, I, I like that. But again, you know, one album and bloop, that's it. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. My last choice um, 
is the cure with head on the door. And we, we could go into all the reasons why I don't have copies of these albums. There's just five or six different reasons. But, but the odd thing is, is um, the head on the door I play all the time. But because, you know, in, the, in this different day and age, I mean, uh, so I must have just sold it off to someone or traded it to someone. And the fact of the matter is um, the most important thing for me for owning copies of these albums is, is it in one of my completely full iPod classics? And is it available on Spotify? Um, so I'm sitting in front of my computer. I'll be playing everything. Even if I own it, I'm going to be playing it off of Spotify. If I'm walking around or driving around, it's going to be from my iPod classic. So that's why a lot of these, I feel like, well, I, they're, they're just as accessible as always, even though I don't own a copy anymore. So it's really weird. So the cure is a weird band. I mean, yeah, for, for me in terms of owning, here's my two copies of the wish and, you know, a, f a few others, right. And, you know, big, never enough single, but I don't have any of my vinyl anymore. Used to own all of it. Um, but I've got them in here as one of these bands that um, it, 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 to me, this one feels out of everybody I've talked about here. It feels like, like uh, that, that thing I say, a retirement band, a band that I just want to sit down with the whole catalog for a few weeks on end and really get more and more and more into it. But I do realize everything from before the head on the door, which is August 25th, 85. And there's four or five albums before that. Um, I, I have played those many, many times over my whole life since they came out. And I do know them when I put them on, but I really don't feel like they, they've, I've ingested them well enough. But Head on the Door is one of these where it's got a really dark, gothic, deathy album cover, but it's actually quite poppy inside. But the poppiness is also still really creepy. It's another one I could have included in the creepy albums thing, but every single song on it, gorgeously recorded acoustic guitars good drums on it um there's even one with like some some really distorted bass on it near the end of it called screw but in between days close to me um everything's written by robert smith on this album it's just the one uh so i i love the cure so so this is the whole idea i love the cure but it feels like almost everything else is i've never really ingested them properly and understood them kind of like the kansas catalog um but um, yeah, the top, the one just before this is also a masterpiece, but this is the one where I know every song and it's the one I go to and play over and over and over again um, and just love it to death. Again, uh, a commonality between this and the chameleons is, is David M. Allen, who's kind of like a, like a goth post-punk producer. He produced this album again and it sounds absolutely gorgeous, but uh, yeah, perfect example, but, but one of these where, it's not a drop down to nothingness for all the other albums. It's a drop down. It's a huge drop down, but then it's like three or four. When I play them, I know them really, really well. And it's mostly all those early ones. Um, and then, yeah, I, I do remember distinctly at the time. Also the next one that came out, kiss me, kiss me, kiss me, uh, which was a double album. I was totally disappointed with it. So it, it almost like reinforced how amazing the head on the door is. Um, it's considered the most accessible, but it is, it is still dark and spooky, but accessible at the same time. There you go. Yeah, this is, uh, this is one of those bands that, uh, so many people like, and I just never, never saw it, never heard it. You know, I, 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 I don't know, maybe about a decade or two ago, I was like, all right, I've been hearing people talk about this band for ages. I've heard songs here and there. I was like, what am I missing here? Am I missing anything? Right. So I went and again, this is generally what I do when there's a band that, you know, they have a good amount of albums and I'm trying to figure out why I don't like them or I just am indifferent to them. So I went out and bought a greatest hit set. And I'm like, and I recognize a few of the songs, the hit songs. I was like, all right, whatever. But for the most part, it just didn't do anything for me. And I'm like, I don't, I don't, because they have a great look, I think. I mean, they're definitely cool looking, unique. And then I listen to the music and I'm like, yeah, I don't know. Just sometimes there's just certain bands that like, they're not meant for me, I guess. Right. So yeah, yeah it, it's funny. It's like you say you go out and get a greatest hits, but, but it's almost like, the theme of this episode is sometimes when that happens to me, I want to go hear the key album start to finish yeah. and, and really get into it that way. And that, and that, that could drive this idea of, uh, of you loving one album to death and then, and then still like you, you can't get into the other ones or whatever, but yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, for me, I, I think, uh, and, and I, I don't like doing the greatest hits thing. I think that usually I do that in a situation where I'm just really unsure and I'm like, and I'm trying to kind of like get my feet wet and I figure, well, you know, the, in most cases, a lot of the hits I'm sort of familiar with, but usually some greatest hits uh, sets do have like deep cuts and things like that. I'm, I'm always hoping that something will spark me to then, because usually a greatest hits collection, whenever I do that, uh, generally speaking if i like what i hear there then i go get all the whole catalog that's usually what i do um it's almost like a uh, I, I don't i don't want to go out and buy the whole catalog first because i'm really unsure uh but in this instance really nothing grabbed me and i was kind of like hmm. but you know maybe it's just me i don't know or the deluxe version of the greatest hits is is immersing yourself in a box set right where you yeah, get the yeah, liner yeah. notes where someone tells you why you're supposed to love this band right <laughs> yeah. and you go okay well now i get it right you've said some good things here and that's what a good rock critic does for you right i mean gets you gets you excited about the band because they tell you some neat things about it and you or they or they basically they convince you that the band are geniuses right yeah. and then it's like okay well obviously i i really have to try a little harder here right yeah <laughs> sometimes you have to try a little harder right um i mean there, there have been there've been plenty of bands in my life where I just kind of like, you know, everything my ears were hearing was fighting what I was listening to. Yeah. And then eventually it kind of clicks. Right. But sometimes that's a lot of work. And when you're trying to do that with a lot of bands, it's a, a lot, a lot of work. So, all right. My final choice for today is uh, a, a perfect one for this, for me. This is a, a band that most people deem as absolutely legendary, absolutely influential. And I would, I would agree with that. But I think most of this acclaim and praise that they get from critics and fans really has to do with one album of theirs. And they weren't all around for all that long. They don't have a ton of albums, but it always seems to come back to uh, kick out the jams by the MC5, which kind of, and it was kind of crazy when you think about it, that a brand new band, their first album is a live album, chock full of, from a performance of stuff that nobody knows, right? And it's the one that everybody talks about and the one that everybody goes back to. You know, they released uh, Back in the USA in High Time after this, Quite, I have them. I never listened to them. I don't think either one of them really captures the excitement of what this is all about, which is this is one of the first like, you know, proto punk albums, whatever you want to call. It. I mean, it was called probably hard rock or proto metal at the time. But when you really listen to this, along with the early Stooges albums, I mean, this is punk before there was punk. And this is full of energy and lots of character. And, it, you know, you listen to this, and you're like, man, I would have liked to have been in the audience for that show, right? It's got lots of balls. It's raucous. I mean, you got a great front man who's connecting with an audience. You got a really good guitar player. You got these memorable songs. I mean, the album's not long enough for one, uh, but it's just, it's one of the great live documents of this era, you know, of the 60s, the late 60s. And I just think that like, if you're in a discussion with someone about the MC5 and they say, well, I've never heard them before. What album should I listen to? Well, the only album that really matters is this one. So this to me, I never listened to the other ones. I really don't really have any kind of feeling one way or the other about them. But this one is a classic. And to me, it's the only one I really like. So. yeah it's recorded really well it is heavy so it's proto heavy metal and proto punk and uh you know i i always in my mind i'll, I'll never be able to shake this and and i hate thinking of it the uh, any other way but to, to me when i listen to that album it feels like them at the democratic national convention outdoors and and because the album cover is one of those like like the pat travers right pat travers live like fog hat live where you think it's it's played outdoors in front of a hundred thousand people. It's got that look to it. Yep. Um, but in fact, it was recorded at the Grandy Ballroom, right? So it's so it's an indoors album, right? Uh, and, and yeah, that that bothers me about it, right? It's it's like it's like I can I always think about them because of that great live footage you see of them playing live outside and like the the absolute charisma of that band and how yep. they've just got the you know the the James Brown uh, you know work ethic down. By this point, they've been a band for for something like three years. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, what what a great album. And, and the other reason it's got that great catchy title and that great and that's the most modern song on that album. And that song gets covered a fair bit. Right. It's, yeah. it's an anthem. Right. And Blue Oyster Cult covered it even, right on on some enchanted evening. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, you're right. I mean, when he's when he's talking to the crowd and you hear all the crowd noise in the background on this album, you really think that they're they're in front of like 
10, 20,000 people, right? Yeah, yeah, no? exactly. <laughs> it sounds much bigger than it is, a little deceptive, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. 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 But yeah, to me, that's that's the only MC5 album anybody really needs. The others, eh, you know, if you're a completist like me, you got to have them, but yeah. never listen to them. So yeah, yeah. Cool, cool. There you have it, everybody. Uh, five bands where we only really love one album five you know they may have some other ones that are halfway decent but uh you know there's really only one in our minds that we keep coming back to so uh let us know if you have any uh, bands where you falls into the same category as this you know they got lots of albums or maybe only a few but really there's only one that kind of does it for you and please list that in the comments below martin uh what's going on over uh, the podcast coming up on the contrarians uh books in stock all that sort of thing um, well, a few things, but I just wanted to mention some, some quick honor, honorable mentions as well. Oh, yeah. I mean, um, and these are, these are odd ones, but I, I was, I was swept up in the excitement about that one Howard Jones album that was really big. Um, I wanted to include pretenders in this, but for me, it's the first two albums. I worship them to death. Don't know anything about the other ones. Mud Honey was a funny one where I worship the first EP and then it goes downhill kind of very quickly because they're so sixties and archivish sounding. Right. Um, I, Prince, one album, Purple Rain, don't care about anything else. I don't get Prince at all. Um, even Terrence Trent Darby, I was I was swept up in the excitement over his first album and second album at the time. Tom Waits is a perfect one like this as well. Swept up in the excitement around Rain Dogs, uh, but the before stuff was a little too conventional. And then later it was, eh, it was just kind of Rain Dogs all over again sort of thing. So so yeah, it's it's funny. You get swept up in, into that that excitement uh, on, on this stuff. And, and a lot of metal ones are like this as well. Yeah. Um, Prince not to put you on the spot, but any any honor, anything you almost included in this? Or? Yeah, well, it's Prince's, I didn't pick Prince, but that's an interesting one because I think the more you think about it, Purple Rain is pretty much like a perfect album. And I like a lot of Prince albums, but I don't think I like any of them quite like I like Purple Rain because I think a good chunk of them have some good songs here and there, but they're all really spotty. Like, I, I don't know if I like Prince, uh, Purple Rain for me would probably be a, a four or four and a half out of five star for me um, out of five. Uh, it, it's a great album. I remember when that came out, man, everybody was listening to that, regardless of what type of music you really liked. And I, I have most of the Prince catalog, if not all of them. And I don't know if any of the other albums are strong like that at all. I mean, there's there's moments, certainly and there's some albums that are absolutely awful. But yeah, that's a good one. Uh, the first Cars album. I think the Cars debut is, again, like a perfect album. And I like Candy O. And the other albums after that kind of, it's like a law of yeah, diminishing sure. returns. But I think that debut is absolutely spectacular, legendary. And I would yeah. say that's probably the only Cars album I really love. I like Candy O, but the first album is definitely it for me. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you could, uh, I mean, he passed away today and I'm going to do a, a tribute show to him. That's right. Yes. Meatloaf yeah. passed away today. And uh, I would say he's got some solid records, but really the only one that I truly, really love is that out of hell, the first one. Yeah. So there's some other good ones, but really the only one that really, really, really matters that if you're only going to listen to one album, that's the one. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. cool yeah no like like i say yeah so so on the podcast the next one will be early mutt lang i i just finished three episodes on drums we had drum flourishes drum intros and drum hooks as the last three episodes of that and contrarians uh there was a black sabbath that went up with uh with marco and don on dehumanizer tonight we're doing a panel on uh rockarola so this is those panels are, are really a lot of a lot of good information comes out so there'll be like six of us talking for an hour on just one album on rockarola so that's kind of cool um and then yeah books there's not not really much happening right now um you know i have stock of all my books martinpopoff.com there's a lot of books that are finished that are coming out uh over the next little while but uh but nothing super new recently other than i guess the hawkwind visual history the the heap one the nazareth one those are those are kind of the latest so yeah that's what's going on cool and just before i forget uh i almost picked mike oldfield tubular bells for this episode ah <laughs> right yeah, I, yeah but then i was like uh but i kind of really like was amadong Ahmed, or the, the third album he did which is actually really good it's very underrated mm -hmm. i think but you know for me the only one i really listen to uh with any kind of frequency is tubular yeah. bells but i decided to leave it out but uh could have yeah. picked that so <laughs> 
So there you have it, everybody. Uh, thanks for watching. Uh, visit us on the web at www.catranquility.org. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. Of course, we're here on YouTube all the damn time. Stay tuned for another episode of Friday Morning at the Funhouse with Martin next Friday. Till then, make sure you subscribe if you haven't already and click on that notification bell. We've also got the link to our Ko-Fi page and our merch page below. So uh, go and investigate that as well uh, for Martin Popo, Fine P. Pardo. Have a good weekend, everybody. Stay tuned for the UK Connection tomorrow with Simon Bray and Stephen Reed for more uh, shenanigans with our two UK folks and then uh, album homework assignment on Sunday Ryan Scow going up against Craig Kaminsky so stay tuned for that and just in case anybody's asking Martin and I are going to go head to head once again fairly soon on album homework assignment so stay tuned for that in the weeks ahead so uh, for Martin I and Pete take care everybody